Good afternoon. May I have everyone's attention as we begin today's commemoration of the 241st anniversary of the Patriot victory at the Battle of Cowpens. My name is David Smith. I'm the president of the South Carolina Society, Sons of the American Revolution, and I'll be your master of ceremonies this afternoon. On behalf of the South Carolina SAR, welcome to today's commemoration and thank you for coming out. The Patriot victory we honor today with this solemn commemoration is known as the turning point of the Revolutionary War in the South. It was part of a chain of events that led to our forefathers' victory at Yorktown and our independence from England. We'll hear more about the battle later in the ceremony. I'm proud to say that today's commemoration is co-hosted by the city of Gaffney. I'd like to invite Gaffney's Director of Marketing and Tourism, Ms. Leanne Moon, to the podium. Good afternoon and welcome to Gaffney. Uh, the most important thing that I may tell some of you, I know you've made uh, long trips and all, we do have public restrooms here and they are located in that brick building. If you just follow the walkway around, they're on the bottom floor, so the walkway goes right to them. All right, that's always the thing everybody loves for me to tell. Uh, on behalf of uh, Mayor Moss and the Gaffney City Council, welcome to Gaffney. Uh, he was sorry that he could not be here today, but he did sign a proclamation and asked me to read and present that to you. Whereas the city of Gaffney, South Carolina, is located in Cherokee County, the only county in the nation with three Revolutionary War units in the National Park System, Cowpens, Bat Cowpens National Battlefield, Kings Mountain National Military Park, and the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. And whereas on January 17, 1781, a battle ensued on pasture land known as the Cowpens. And whereas Patriot forces led by General Daniel Morgan defeated Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Charlton and his army in less than one hour, a battle that would be recorded throughout history as a turning point of the American Revolution. And whereas the sacrifices of those soldiers, citizens, their, and their families that fought in the Battle of Cowpens established the liberties we enjoy today as a free America. And whereas the city of Gaffney recognizes, commemorates, and promotes the significance of this heritage and whereas descendants of these veterans are members of the South Carolina Society of the American Revolution and the National Society of the American Revolution, whose primary purpose is to honor those who served or assisted the colonies during the, American, during the Revolutionary War, to protect our Constitution and perpetuate American ideals and traditions, and to educate our youth about the Constitution and those who develop the American ideals and traditions. Now, therefore, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Gaffney, South Carolina, and on behalf of the Gaffney City Council and all citizens hereof, I do hereby proclaim Monday, January 17, 2022, as the 221st anniversary of the Battle of Cowpens, and call this observance to the attention of all of our citizens, encouraging all citizens of our city to observe this anniversary and the significance of this local battle for the freedoms of America. Thank you, Leanne. Would everyone please stand and remain standing for a few minutes. Our invocation is offered by Reverend Lawrence Peoples, the Senior Vice President of the South Carolina SAR. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we gather in this place. Remember the, the men who fought at the Battle of Cowpens that our nation might be free. We ask that you would continue to bless our nation. Watch over our men and women in uniform who continue to protect us this day. And bless us as we gather to remember. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you. The SAR Color Guard will now present and post the colors. Color Guard, attention. Four are carry colors. Four march. Joseph Smith, president of the Colonel James Williams Society of the Children of the American Revolution, will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Color guard, salute. A Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. The salute to the flag of South Carolina will be led by compatriot William Allgood of the General Andrew Pickens chapter. Would you please join me in the salute to the flag of South Carolina? I salute the flag of South Carolina and pledge to the of the state, love, loyalty, and faith. Thank you. Will compatriot Ted Walker, Piedmont Region Vice President, please lead us in the SAR pledge. We, the descendants of the American Revolution, who by their sacrifices established the United States of America, reaffirm our faith in the principles of liberty. Thank you. Compatriot Gabe Bobo of the Major Robert Crawford Chapter, SAR, will lead in reciting the Americans, <coughs> Americans' Creed. I believe in the United States of America as a government of the people, by the people, for the people, whose just powers are derived from the consent of the government. Thank you, everyone. May be seated. Color right face. Gabe Bobo, the second vice president of the National Society Children of the American Revolution, is invited to bring greetings on behalf of his National Society. This 
District 2 Director of the South Carolina Daughters of the American Revolution, Ms. Allison Strange, is invited to bring greetings on behalf of her society. Good afternoon. On behalf of State Regent Bonnie Bell Moffat, I have the privilege and the pleasure of bringing greetings from the South Carolina State Society, Daughters of the American Revolution. The South Carolina Daughters are truly honored to be included in this 241st anniversary commemoration of the decisive American victory against the British in the battle at the Cowpens. We commend the South Carolina Sons of the American Revolution and the city of Gaffney for hosting this event and for supporting the common goals of the sons and the daughters and the children of the American Revolution in remembering and celebrating our patriot ancestors and the battles that led to America's independence. We offer a heartfelt thank you for the opportunity to participate in this noteworthy occasion. Thank you, Allison. Joseph Smith, the president of the Colonel James Williams Society, Children of the American Revolution, is invited to bring greetings for his state society. Good afternoon. On behalf of Jay Bobo, the state president of the South Carolina Society, Children of the American Revolution, and our over 150 members, I bring you greetings today. The CAR is the oldest children's lineage organization in the country, with it coming up on its 127th birthday. The main mission of the CAR is to remember our history and the patriots who fought and died for our liberties. It's an honor to bring greetings today as we honor the patriots who sacrificed so much here 241 years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. I'm very pleased to introduce our guest speaker, compatriot Gabe Bobo. Gabe is both a member of the Sons of the American Revolution and the Children of the American Revolution, where he serves as a national officer as the elected national second vice president. Good afternoon. It is an honor and a privilege to gather here today to remember the veterans of the Battle of Cowpens who fought 241 years ago. Why was a giant cow pasture the perfect place for such an important battle? How could a battle that lasted less than an hour play such an important role in the American Revolution? <coughs> Think about that, about what led up to the battle. In 1779, when the British started what we now call the Southern Campaign of the American Revolution, their goal was simple. Rally support from the Loyalists to crush the rebellion in the South, the British were able to gain control of Savannah, Charleston, Camden, and other important areas in the Carolinas. This control played a pivotal role in the South's economy. While in the process, the British happened to take out much of the Southern Continental Army. As the skirmishes and battles took place through Georgia and the Carolinas, this became a true civil war, pitting neighbor against neighbor and fathers against sons. In response to the British rampage throughout the South, Nathaniel Green, split the small remains of his Continental Army into two groups. Green's goal consisted of two parts. First, cut off the British supply lines and slow down the British operations in the southern backcountry. And second, to as I quote, spirit up the people, Green's phrase for boosting the morale of the southern patriots. In early January of 1781, Lord Cornwallis sent Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton to find Daniel Morgan. This pursuit was tenuous. Both armies were facing inclement weather that forced them to travel through extremely muddy roads and white rising floodwaters. On January 12th, Tarleton scouts located Daniel Morgan's army. They were at the Grendel Shoals on the Passalot River. On the same day, Colonel Andrew Pickens learned that Tarleton was rapidly moving north and sent word to alert Daniel Morgan. Tarleton and his legion were well known for covering a lot of ground very quickly when they were in pursuit of their prey. They began a highly aggressive chase after Daniel Morgan. Due to the high rivers, it took Tarleton two days to find a place to cross, build rafts, and swim his horses across both swollen rivers. Knowing that Tarleton was on the hunt, Morgan retreated to Burr's Mill on Thickety Creek, located between the two modern cities of Spartanburg and Gaffney. As Morgan traveled the countryside, he assembled the local militia, and more militia continued to join him. 
On January 16th, Morgan's scouts cried the alarm that Tarleton had crossed the pass lot. He was closer than Morgan had anticipated. The troops, who were in the middle of cooking and eating their breakfast, immediately began to break camp. Morgan, again surprised by the speed at which Tarleton had closed the distance, has said to have left so fast that he left his breakfast hot behind him. That night, Daniel Morgan camped at Cowpens. Cowpens was a well-known crossroads and frontier pasture and ground. This South Carolina pasture is heavily associated with the early cattle industry. It's roughly 500 yards long and just as wide. There was little undergrowth as it was kept clear by grazing cattle taken there in the spring. This place had been used four months prior when the Overmountain men had camped at Cowpens before the Battle of Kings Mountain. Once Morgan arrived at Cowpens, he began to spread the word for militia groups to join him there. As he was escorted over the fields of Cowpens, the militia poured in from different directions and he continued to arrive throughout the night on January 16th. The army set up camp in the valley of two small hills. Morgan had a reputation for good commander because he was known for spending time with his men and moving around camp to check on them and boost their morale. At some point that night, Andrew Pickens, the wizard owl, and his militia arrived in camp. The militia were in good spirits and ready to fight. Both Pickens and Morgan knew morale was important and gave speeches to the entire force that was assembled. They told stories of previous successful battles, laid out the battle plan, and talked bad about the British to try and rile up their men. <laughs> These speeches were especially effective towards the militia who were weary after the brutality they'd faced in the past months. After all the speeches, the entire force was in good spirits and ready to fight. While most of his men slept that night, Morgan remained awake. Not because he was cold or scared, but because Morgan was excited to his plan to come to fruition the next morning. Tarleton, however, did not have the same kind of evening. Instead of resting with his men, he was marching his exhausted and hungry men with the desire to catch up to Daniel Morgan. His men only slept a few hours that night as he awakened them at 2 a.m. on the morning of the 17th to continue pursuing Morgan. Tarleton had heard of the Overmountain men and what had happened at Cowpens. When word spread that Morgan was at Cowpens and the Overmountain men may be joining them, Tarleton began his aggressive, urgent march and attack style. Tarleton was cocky before the battle had even begun. He was convinced that Morgan was trapped because of the swollen broad river at his back and the terrain of the Cowpens was more than ideal for his infamous Green Dragoons and he believed that the Patriots were desperate if they were to stop here. Morgan saw it differently. He had an ingenious plan. He knew he couldn't escape because the Broad River was at his back and the floodwaters were continuing to rise. He had seen the militia retreat time and time again in the face of oncoming bayonet charges. This time, however, that was not going to happen in chaos. As the sun rose in the clear sky and began to bright through the frost-covered ground, Morgan scouts came back with the news of the impending battle. It was finally the morning of the 17th and Tarleton and his men were quickly approaching. Boys, get up! Benny's coming! rang out across the entire camp. The sound of horses' feet coming down the road grew louder and louder. The British line extended the entire width of the field with artillery in the middle and 50 dragoons on each side. This frontal attack was no surprise to Morgan, however, who had lined up on the opposite side of the field with three lines of patriots. The sharpshooters and regulars were in the first row. Andrew Pickens arranged 300 militiamen in the second row, in the third row was the Patriots' own Green Dragoons and Continental Army. As the battle started, the sharpshooters who fielded the first row took out the officers to cause chaos and create an initial advantage. The sharpshooters then retreated behind the second line of militia. Andrew Pickens now took over. Under his command, the militia fired two shots once the British were within 50 yards. The militia line withdrew according to plan. Tarleton had been deceived, for he was sure a route was on. Then Morgan ordered the counterattack on the British Dragoons. Green Dragoons barreled down the field, slashing anything in their way. Militiamen ran around trees and fought back with their rifles. The surprised cavalry began to sense they were fixing to be routed. Eighteen of their men had fallen on the field of battle. The final line of defense, consisting of blue-coated Continentals, now took over. With the cavalry in retreat, the infantry began to trade volleys. Suddenly, the shrill sounds of fifes and the drumming of drums rang out across the field. The line of redcoats began to advance in a slow speed and slowly increasing. While this action was going on, Pickens rallied the militia to the front, who yet again were scattering at the sign of bayonets. Morgan <laughs> cheered on the militia as well and said, Form! Form! Form, my brave fellows! Give them one more fire and the day is ours! could be heard above it all. 
Bagpipes began to fill the air as more green jackets entered the field. The 71st Highlanders are charging towards the Continental Line. The confusion is now growing. Lieutenant Colonel John Eager Howard and his Continental right flank turn into the charge. With all the noise and confusion, the Virginians misunderstood the order began to retreat. However, this retreat actually moved the Virginians from harm's way. Morgan used this retreat to his advantage. He rides to the final line and orders the line to turn around and fire. A sea of red and green fall to the ground in front of a wall of thick smoke. Even with an already massive death toll, the British broke into a wild, uncontrollable bayonet charge, only to meet an organized bayonet charge by the Patriots. The British broke and the tide of the battle has now changed. At this point, Colonel Andrew Pickens re-enters the battle. Pickens and his militia move forward and push the charge of Scottish Highlanders. Andrew Pickens and the militia continue to place fire and pressure by firing muskets as the Highlanders try to regroup. They are blasted by muskets, assaulted by bayonets and sabers, and the Highlanders begin to run. This is the first known instance of the Highland Regiment running from the Patriots. The mass surrender of the British has now began. Buddy Band and his men continued to fight. As time went on, Tarleton began to see the futility in the fight and fled from the field back down the Green River Road from which he came. In less than an hour, the smoke had cleared and the fight was over. For the Patriots, 72 casualties, 12 killed, 60 wounded. The British losses, however, were much more severe. 86% of Tarleton's forces were dead, wounded, or captured. 110 dead, 200 wounded, 500 men captured. In England, it was said that another loss like that would ruin the British Army. The most dramatic moment of the battle occurred when William Washington engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Bannister Tarleton and two of his officers. This all occurred right in front of his infamous Green Dragoons. A Patriot Beagler grabbed a pistol, fired and killed a British officer with a raised saber coming towards Washington. Beagler saved Washington's life and forced Tarleton to, f to leave the field with what was left of his once strong army, only to have to tell Cornwallis of the horrific defeat. To add insult to the injury, some of the stragglers during the retreat from the British were overtaken. With the battle now completely over, Daniel Morgan knew that General Cornwallis would be after him. He ordered his men to hurriedly bury the dead in what was called wolf pits. Morgan then headed north with his army. He crossed the broad at Island Ford and headed on to Gilbert Town and then on to Catawba. The prisoners he had were slowing him down. He stayed in Catawba for a few days to rest and regroup with his men and sent his prisoners on to Winchester, Virginia. Daniel Morgan and Nathaniel Green reunited and conferred about their next move. Morgan wanted to go to the mountains while Green wanted to march north to Virginia to get supplies. Green was still in command in one set discussion. Soon after, Daniel Morgan retired due to health issues. He had come down with rheumatism and suffered from reoccurring bouts of malarial fever. General Cornwallis was now in a state of distress. How could a group of ragtag soldiers win against Tarleton's battle-hardened troops? Green and Cornwallis are now in a race for the Dan River at the North Carolina-Virginia line. Cornwallis burned any extra baggage that he had that would slow down his travel. These items included military supplies, tents, tools, and rations. Men were stationed along the Catawba River to slow the British as they were trying to cross. Green got to the Dan River first and had Cornwallis right where he wanted him. Cornwallis was now far from supply centers, and he was short on food and other essential supplies. They returned to Guilford Courthouse, and Green used similar tactics that had been used in Calpens. While the British held the field, it cost another 500 dead or wounded. Nathaniel's Green's strategy of attrition was slowly working and forced Cornwallis out of Carolina and into the Virginias. Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown on October 18, 1781, to officially end the war. The Battle of Cowpens was not only a surprising victory for the Patriots, but it was also a turning point in the entire war standpoint from both sides. The Patriots were able to get revenge against Tarleton for what he did at Buford's Massacre, where the, tar the phrase Tarleton's Quarter was coined. Daniel Morgan's idea of spiriting up the people in an unorthodox plan was pulled off successfully. Not only did he lift the spirits of the men in the Carolinas, but he also did it without all the colonies. As said to this day, Daniel Morgan gave Banish for Tarleton and the mighty British Army a devil of a whipping. The Battle of Cowpens was a crucial point 
crucial battle in the Patriot Southern Campaign of the American Revolution. The victory at that battlefield prompted the British to leave the South, turn towards the North with the idea of surrounding General George Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe. Very well done. Compatriot Joe Glavich, the president of the Colonel Robert Anderson chapter, will come forward and read the names of those who are coming to render honors and pay respects to the patriots who fought at the Battle of Cowpens. Please come forward when your name is called. I'll call your name, your organization, and office. Please step forward to honor and remember our brave patriots who defeated the British in the Battle of Cowpens 241 years ago. <coughs> I'll start with the president of the SCSSAR, David Smith. Neil Flanagan, Henry Lawrence Chapter, SAR, president. Reed, William Bratton Chapter, SAR, President. Dave Damaris and William Allgood, SCSAR, General Andrew Pickens Chapter. And William Allgood is a past state president. Gerald Pitts, SCSAR, Cambridge Chapter, <coughs> Outgoing President. Brett Osborne, Colonel James Wood Chapter, SAR, Past President. Ted Walker, Vice President of Piedmont Region, SAR. Pete Waddell, Henry Lawrence Chapter, SAR. Taylor, Colonel Robert Anderson, Chapter SAR, Secretary. Gina Bobo, Elizabeth Hutchinson, Jackson, Chapter DAR, Regent. Christina Jeffries. Battle of Cowpens Chapter, DAR, Regent. Gabe Bobo, National Society, CAR, National Second Vice President. Kelly and Carl Waddell, William Stroud, Chapter CAR. With my apologies ahead of time. Have, have I missed anyone presenting over? Yes, yes. K. Melba, Regent, K. Berry, DAR. Thank you, Kim.
Joseph Smith, president of the Colonel James Williams chapter, CAR. Thank you. Please stand and remain standing for the musket salute by the SAR color guard, be followed by the SAR recessional. You'll, you'll find the musket folks right up there on that ridge. Patriot Neil Flanagan of the Henry Lawrence chapter, please lead us in the SAR recessional. Until we meet again, let us remember our obligations to our forefathers who gave us our Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Supreme Court, and the nation's free people. Thank you. Our benediction is offered by Reverend Lawrence Peoples. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord calls his face to mercifully shine upon you, both this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. On behalf of the city of Gaffney and the South Carolina Sons of the American Revolution, I'd like to thank you for attending and participating in today's ceremony. This ends our commemoration. Please be careful tomorrow. <laughs>